Today we are interviewing Roz Savage. We're going to have a discussion about her brilliant adventure and how inspirational she is to other people. But how did you get into everything with the rowing? I mean, is it a passion or...? I had rowed a long time ago when I was a student and I really enjoyed it then, but then I actually didn't row for 10 years before I decided that I was going to row across oceans, at which point I got back into rowing in quite a big way. Wow. And did, did you start off at, at school or at college? Or? At college. I yeah. was lucky enough to get a place at Oxford and that's when I started rowing. I hated physical education when I was at school. Never did any games if I could avoid it. Um, but then when I got to college, I thought, well, I really ought to do some exercise. Because apart from anything else, I've always had an appetite that's too big for my body. <laughs> and out of being fat, being hungry and doing exercise, I decided that doing exercise was the least of the evils. <laughs> <laughs> that's brilliant. So, so did you compete for the college then at Oxford? Did you actually... I did, yes. I rode for the college crews and I also managed to get into the Oxford University crew in my wow. second year and my third year. And it was brilliant because it really gave me a taste for a different kind of success. I'd been fairly good academically when I was at school, but there's definitely something about sport that teaches you more about teamwork and life skills than just academic success. Yeah, it's definitely a topic that we need to sort of um, bring to children this sort of you know day of age because I mean a lot of them need the team building don't they at the moment and yes and rowing is kind of the ultimate team sport because mm -hmm. the boat goes best when every member of the crew is doing exactly the same thing at exactly the same time mm -hmm. and you can't be competing against the other people in your crew you all really have to work together and when you all get it just absolutely spot on there's nothing like that feeling when the boat is just flying across the water. Mm. I really enjoyed that camaraderie of the crew, not just while we were on the water, but getting together for crew meals afterwards. And I just lived, breathed, dreamt rowing for the three years I was at Oxford. Wow. Yeah, you seem really sort of inspired by it all. And how the, I mean, your whole face is just sort of lit up whenever you're sort of talking about it. It's absolutely, <laughs> honestly, it's, for somebody to have such a, so it is, I mean, for you to row sort of across the Atlantic as well, and now you're doing the Pacific, aren't you? That's and right, yes. Three legs, is it? Yes, um, I did stage one this last summer when mm -hmm. I rode from San Francisco to Hawaii, mm -hmm. set out from under the Golden Gate Bridge wow. in May, and arrived at the Waikiki Yacht Club in Hawaii 99 days later. Gosh. So it's quite, quite a journey. adventure. Yes. <laughs> Ocean rowing is not sport for people in a hurry. Yeah. It's actually been a very good education for me because I'm yeah. not a naturally patient person. Mm -hmm. But for sure the ocean will teach you patience. Definitely. And did you see uh, sort of lots of wildlife when you're out there? Not as much as I would have liked to. Yeah. Uh, most of the wildlife that still remains and a lot of it has actually been killed by human activity. Most of what remains obviously is going on underneath the surface. Yeah. So I did have an amazing day when I saw about 30 dolphins. They were all just wow. leaping out of the water all around my boat and I, I was videoing it um, and most of the soundtrack is just me squealing <laughs> with excitement as I'm running around the deck of the boat filming these dolphins. Oh, they were fantastic. Because you do a lot with the environment. This, I mean, with you sort of rowing as well, you do a lot with sort of the pollution side because you're really trying to make people aware of it. That's right. Stage one of my Pacific row was all about the plastic pollution yeah. in the oceans. There's this North Pacific garbage patch, which is about twice the size of Texas. And yeah. it's just a, a kind of vortex where most of the plastic rubbish is accumulated. And once in a while, when the wind is blowing the right way or the wrong way, it washes up on Hawaiian beaches. So you've got these beautiful white sandy beaches with the palm trees just absolutely covered in plastic mm. trash, which is really heartbreaking to see. Mm. We did a, a beach clean-up just after I, after I arrived in Hawaii. And um, it was actually a bit frustrating because we arrived on this beach and there were just all these big banks of rubbish. And I just wanted to pick up the whole lot, but no, we had to pick up just particular kinds of rubbish so that they could analyse it and figure out where it was coming from. Yeah. So I had to mm. show a bit of restraint. And the next stage of my row is going to be all about climate change um, because we're, we're coming up to the renegotiation of the Kyoto Agreement right. this time next year. And I believe it's a really crucial time for the world that 
we need to make the right decisions then and commit to serious reductions in CO2 emissions because mm. what is decided next December we're then stuck with for the next 10 years mm. and things are changing so fast now mm. that we really need to take some very decisive action. Yeah. So I've got, um, I always like to put a positive spin on things because I think there's been so much gloom and doom about the environment that now almost as soon as people hear the, the environment word they almost immediately go into sort of shutdown mode yeah. um, and even I get my moments of despair and depression and helplessness so instead of focusing on the problem I'm trying to focus on the solution and saying here's something that we could all do tomorrow that would actually help the planet so what I want to do with stage two of the row is get people just walking more and driving less mm. and with the obesity epidemic that's now mm. happening I, th I think it's an absolute win-win situation it's good for our health and it's good for the planet yeah it's brilliant I'm, I'm, I'm really inspired by everything that you're doing for, especially for the environment for these poor little animals you know and it's it is such a shame to see everything that's sort of just happening around us we, we can do something about it and that's what you're making you know, everybody aware about. I think it's absolutely brilliant. I think there's also a danger that people think, oh, well, what can I do? I'm just one person out of six billion, and what I do won't make any difference. Mm. But the reason that we sort of ended up in this mess has not been by a few big dramatic events. It's been death by a thousand million cuts. Mm. Uh, it's been the accumulation of all those tiny little actions. And I think that's probably the way that we need to get ourselves out of this pickle as well, mm. is by just each of us as individuals saying, well, I'm going to do my bit. Mm. And that does have a ripple effect. People will see what you're doing, that you're parking a bit further away from the office and walking the last mile, or if you're using your reusable grocery bag in the, in the supermarket, mm. people will see that and they'll say, oh, well, that wouldn't be so difficult. I could do that mm. too. And I think gradually we'll that web will just start interconnecting much more and hopefully everybody will get into greener habits. Yeah, definitely. the hardest thing I'd ever done. I felt like I was so well prepared going into it. I'd really done my research. I'd spoken to every ocean rower that I could find. There's only At that time, there were only about 200 or so people in the world that rode across an ocean. And I really felt like I must have spoken to most of them. But I don't think there's anything that can fully prepare you for the reality of being out there. And I probably made life much tougher for myself than I needed to psychologically. I just made every mistake in the book. Things like looking at the whole 3,000 miles that lay ahead of me and feeling totally overwhelmed by the scale of the challenge rather than breaking it down into smaller chunks and then celebrating each milestone as I passed it. And when you look at a huge challenge like that, uh, and you feel so overwhelmed by it. it, it's quite easy to feel quite depressed, actually. And so I would say that my, my second journey across the Pacific, I really got the hang of that much better and did just take it one little bit at a time. I always keep in mind my goal, where I'm going to, and I love having my little daydreams about what it's going to be like to arrive there. And then I'll focus on today and what I need to do right now in order to get there but I absolutely refuse to think about anything in between because if I try and think about what it's going to be like six weeks from now it all just gets too much for me. Yeah got it, it sounds brilliant and have you got like a um, the most exciting point of your journey across the Atlantic? Exciting. Um, <laughs> the best bit was definitely arriving. Really? <laughs> the arrival in that Antigua was just brilliant um, because it had been so tough out there. I'd had so many problems, not just 
the psychological issues, but I'd been injured. I developed tendonitis on about day three and was taking painkillers on and off most of the way across. I also got saltwater sores on my backside, which can really spoil your day. They were very mm. painful. I had a lot of equipment failures. All four of my oars broke and I had to repair them so that I could carry on. Uh, my camping stove broke, so I hadn't had any hot food for ages. And my stereo broke, so I couldn't listen to music. So there have been a few issues out there. And oh. it had just been so hard at times just to keep myself going. And in fact, there was one day when I was so down and I was talking to my mum. I would check in with her most days on the satellite phone. And we had to keep our conversations really short because the calls are very expensive. But I was so down. It was the only time in the crossing that I actually cried. And mum said, do you want to give up? And I had to think quite hard for a moment. But then I said, no, I absolutely don't want to give up. Carrying on is going to be really hard, but giving up would just be so much worse. Yeah. And that actually really helped me because it made me look at my struggles in the bigger context. And I knew that it was all going to be worthwhile in the end. And in fact, it would be even more worthwhile because it had been so hard yeah. on the way across that the sense of achievement would be huge. And it really was. When I arrived in Antigua, the people there were fantastic. They were all lined up along the cliffs and people on the boats were sounding their horns and there were all these air horns going and people were cheering and clapping and it was just the the best feeling. I was just grinning from ear to ear. I don't think I stopped grinning for a week. Mm. It was just a really incredible sense of achievement mm. because I'd had this big ambitious plan. I'd really struggled with it, but I'd made it through. Got all the way there. Yeah, well, congratulations on that. Thank you. Um, it's the, the whole journey, I mean, for you to just describe it as well, I mean, you, you broke your oars as well? They, they broke? They did, because the weather was so rough, the oh. waves were so big, and if the wave caught me sideways on the boat, would get sort of pushed across on top of the oar, and the oar would end up wrapped around the, the side of the boat, which didn't really do it too much no. good. So, you live and learn. Now I've got different kind of oars. <laughs> <laughs> Those are carbon fibre ones, and now I've gone back to natural materials. Yeah. My oars now are made out of solid ash, and they are Ooh. seriously strong. Gosh. Fantastic. And so with all of your preparations, sort of your mentally and, and physically preparing for your Atlantic journey, um, would there be anything that you would change of and what you should, you know, should sort of further do? Mm, I've made a few modifications, as well as the, the different oars. I'm also using a different kind of camping stove. <laughs> and um, my, my massive breakthrough with the first stage of the Pacific Row was I've discovered audio books, <laughs> which just really make the time pass so much more easily. Because on the Atlantic, I really had nothing apart from my own thoughts to keep me entertained for 12 hours a day while I rode for 103 days. Mm -hmm. And, you know, even in the Bible, when they go off into the desert, they only have 40 days and 40 <laughs> nights of solitude. <laughs> and I think that the human brain, when it doesn't really have enough input, a bit too much introspection can actually be quite a bad thing. Mm -hmm. I think a certain amount of introspection is good. Um, you know, as, as they say, the life unexamined is a life not yeah. worth living. So it is good to think about things deeply but I think that when you are just out there for day after day after day it can get quite boring and quite depressing mm -hmm. if you don't have any mental stimulation so I really really enjoyed listening to the audio books because a good book can just take you to a different place mm -hmm. and I listened to a real mix of books some were fiction some were non-fiction uh, but all of them had something to bring to me some fresh perspective mm -hmm. and that was that was really fantastic so, um, in your boat then, do you have some music as well that you can listen to, or is it just your audio books? I do have music, but I actually found that I preferred listening to the books. Yeah. I just enjoyed having something to stimulate my mind. Yeah. So, did you um, really find yourself when you were rowing across the Atlantic? Did I find myself? I think... To an extent, I'd started to find myself before that, yeah. um, which is how I ended up on the Atlantic. Yeah. For 11 years, I'd worked in an office as a management consultant, yeah. and that was not me. 
Um, I did it because when I graduated from Oxford, I suppose everybody wanted to be a management consultant or an investment bank. It was the Thatcher years and we were sort of almost brainwashed to believe that having um, a good job and lots of money and a nice car and a big house and foreign holidays would make us happy. Mm -hmm. And I really bought into that. I really thought that all those things would make me happy. Yeah. And I had to go there and try it to find out that it just wasn't working for me. There may well be people it does work for and, mm. you know, great for them. Yeah. But for me personally, it just didn't really key into my values. Mm. And when I realised that, it was actually, I had to turn my life upside down because mm. suddenly my whole value system wasn't valid anymore. And I knew what wasn't working for me, but I didn't know what would. So I really had to do a lot of thinking. Mm. And I did go through mm, several years, quite a lot of soul searching, just trying to figure it all out. It's not the sort of thing that can be done overnight. Mm. So I was reading books and writing in my journal a lot and just really trying to figure out what would work for me. And that was a very, very formative experience for yeah. me. Definitely. And um, you went to Peru. That's right. Yeah. yeah. Oh, well, what were you doing there before you... Well, that was really, I suppose, my first solo adventure. And it was when I'd started to figure out my new value system. And I realised that money wasn't the most important thing in life. And I'd started being much less a... I'd always had a plan. I'd been very sort of goal-oriented. And I, I started to become just much more philosophical and sort of go with the flow. Mm. And so Peru was my opportunity to really try out this new mode of living. And I don't think I could have picked a better place. For me, Peru was just an absolutely magical experience. Mm. I went there for three months and I specifically wanted to write a book, which was a really good way to approach my travels because it meant that when things got a bit interesting, which could potentially have been quite stressful, like, you know, when all my travel plans were going a bit awry, as they tend to do in Peru, because buses break down and you get on the wrong train or, or whatever. Um, I would go, well, it might not be that much fun right now, but it'd be great material for the book. And that slightly detaching yourself from your own life mm -hmm. can actually be quite good. You go, well, it might not be fun right now, but it's character building. Yeah. So... I had an absolutely fantastic time there. Peru gave me the perfect material for the book and I, I really felt like all I had to do was really just write it down. Mm. The story almost constructed itself. Wow. And I think a few people have found Peru quite a magical yeah. kind of place. Mm. There's something about the people and the culture and the history yeah. and the scenery, the magnificent mountains there. Yeah. It Sounds was like a incredible. Place. Yeah, mm. I haven't had the opportunity to go there yet. Hopefully. It's Years highly recommended. <laughs> <laughs> so, did, did your dreams come, like, to, when to, you know, to row the Atlantic, did your dreams come from when you went to Peru? Did you sort of find all of your answers there that you wanted to do, you know, like your list of things? No, I didn't. Um, I think what Peru did for me was that it confirmed that I was on the right track. Yeah. That um, these new values that I was adopting were actually going to work for me. And... So when I came back from Peru and I'd finished writing up the book, after that, for a while, I was looking around for the next project, mm -hmm. um, the, the perfect project. And I toyed with a few other ideas. For a while, I was going to ride a motorbike around the area of America where there's the highest concentration of the, the Native Americans. I wanted to learn more about their culture. But then I failed my motorbike test. Oh. And then I was going to um, start an organic baking business. And I've seen that for a bit, but then I, I got um, quite an, a painful injury and I couldn't actually, baking could be quite physical. Mm -hmm. And so I wasn't able to carry on with that for long enough to just make me rethink the whole thing. Yeah. So I was, I was kind of zigzagging around a bit and really trying to find the perfect project. And then one day this idea just came to me to row across oceans. Mm. Uh, I did have a friend who'd rowed across the Atlantic in the first ever Atlantic rowing race with his mother. And uh, I suppose the fact that his mother had done it made me believe that it was <laughs> doable. And it'd be challenging, but you know, it seemed to be just that right balance between mm. a big enough challenge that it would stretch me, mm. but not so 
hugely challenging, that it would be impossible. And so my first thought when I had this idea was, that is perfect, that is absolutely brilliant. But then my second thought was, oh my word, no, I can't do that, it's way too adventurous, it's impossible. So for a week I, I didn't mention it to anybody and I was really trying to talk myself out of it. But each morning I would just wake up with more and more reasons why it was so perfect for me. Mm. And so in the end I, I just realised I was going to have to do it. Mm. And it's really weird because I still don't quite to this day know where the idea came from. I know my friend Dan had done it and with his mother, but <laughs> even when he told me about it, I didn't think, oh, there's something I'd love to do. I just kind of went, oh yeah, right, so you rode across the Atlantic. Mm -hmm. um, and it, it really was like the idea found me. Yeah. I don't know how else to describe it. It was almost like, you know, getting a, a calling. Mm. It, it just felt like this was my purpose. Yeah and this was what I needed to do. And just for so many reasons, it was, it was so right. And it was very in tune with my feeling that I, I was getting a few things figured out about life. Um, I had found some values that worked for me and might possibly work for other people. There was also, I'd become much more interested in the environment by now. And having gone from a very, very consumerist lifestyle I was now trying to live in a much lower impact way and I wanted to share that with other people as well. And I suppose just make a contribution. When I'd worked in the office I'd never really had that feeling that I was delivering anything valuable. Yeah. I wasn't making the world a better place in any way. And I don't mean that to sound arrogant, you know, I'm not saying I'm going to change the world yeah. or anything, yeah. but I just wanted to try and do my little bit yeah. to try and leave the world a slightly better place. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Roz, for sharing such a just such an inspirational story and your travels. I mean, I, I want to read your book now as well. That sounds really, really interesting. But like, it's just everything that you've done, you know, to, to have gone from an office to have rode the Atlantic on your own. You broke four oars, you know, you've done absolutely brilliantly, really, really well. And Thanks. I wish you all the luck, all the best luck for, for the future. Thank you. Thank you very much for joining me today. You're Thank welcome. You.